good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, for joining us today in our webinar. Uh, my name is Maria Grigorieva. I'm a senior manager with CPA Global, and I'm presenting today with our alliance member, uh, Yari Zando, uh, who is based in Israel. And we're going to talk today about transfer pricing uh, and pharmaceutical industry. And for those who have not joined our, our webinar before, uh, you are muted, but you can ask questions in the question box. So please feel free to send them and we will be answering them either uh, in the meantime or at the end of the webinar. And if you have any issues with uh, some quality, please also you can raise your hands and ask questions. So today we're gonna talk about the operating models uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, we're also going to talk why certain structures do not work anymore. And lastly, we're going to cover a bit of practical tips uh, for the uh, documentation given the COVID impact. So, uh, as you might know, uh, pharmaceutical and med tech industries were recently influenced by more uh, stringent regulatory measures, particularly in U.S. And of course, more and more pharmaceutical companies are now looking to onshore IP, uh, for example, uh, in Ireland. And lastly, uh, we see the initiatives on pillar one and two, which uh, of course might be abandoned in the end, uh, but they're still hanging uh, like a sword near us. So uh, this could be companies value chains and particularly pharmaceutical ones uh, under certain pressure. And uh, the pharmaceutical industry, of course, uh, is quite a wide definition. So it includes the innovative drugs, it includes biologics and biosimilars. Uh, and for those uh, who joined our webinar and not uh, be the pharma specialist, I'll tell a bit the definition. So innovative uh, or chemically derived drugs uh, are those where a company develops and produces medicines uh, with chemical basis. Uh, and uh, they, of course, uh, invest a lot in R&D uh, and uh, they have seen patents on their drugs. Uh, and those patents nowadays, quite some of them are expiring, so that's an issue for that uh, part of the industry. Uh, then you also have biologics, which is a quite new part of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, these companies develop and produce products based on the biological basis, so that involves uh, use of blood samples, and other biological uh, tissues. Uh, this uh, market sh uh, share is increasing rapidly uh, in the past few years, but of course, uh, these drugs are pretty expensive and require uh, quite a lot of development. And the last part is generics and biosimilars. Generics, probably most of you know, these are uh, the drugs that you can buy off counter and which are. Uh, copying the innovative drugs, but uh, in a way that uh, the patent has expired so that the company can produce these drugs. The same applies to biosimilars, which is really a relatively new industry, but even the biologics patents, some of them are expiring and companies are looking to copy things. And to illustrate uh, the uh, differences between those uh, parts of the industry, as I explained, you can see it on uh, this slide. Uh, where the innovative uh, chemically derived drugs and biologic follow really the full value chain from research to development to manufacturing to them getting uh, market access and then finally selling uh, their products. Uh, while generics and biosimilars have shorter value chains because they don't need to invest that much in uh, research and development, they still do sometimes, uh, but it's of course to a lesser extent. Uh, and here, Yarif, I uh, give a word to you uh, to talk about uh, specialties uh, in uh, yeah, transfer pricing, particularly uh, the research and development uh, for this value chain. Yarif? Um, 
Yarif, I think you're muted. Can you please unmute yourself? Yes, sorry, we lost you for a minute. I, 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 uh, uh, is this to for the song, but can you hear me right now from the computer? Okay. Okay, yeah, the, the sound. Yeah, the I sound. Will, is... I, will, I will try to speak uh, up. Hopefully, can you hear it because something is not working for the song I'm using automatically. Can I continue? Uh, yes. But of course, yeah, if you can try to speak quite loudly because the sound is. Yes, uh, so can you hear me now? I'm speaking loud. Is that okay? Mm, maybe you can try to join through the phone. I, I, I do this for the phone, but uh, I was muted. Shall I try again for the phone? Yes, please. Okay, sorry everybody, I'm trying to get to the phone, it's a technical problem, but I'm trying right now. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, so uh, hopefully uh, that uh, will work. Oh, now there is echo. Now can you hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, I will st still try to make it on time. So again, thank you, Maria, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. Thank you for joining this uh, particular seminar on uh, pharmaceutical. Um, you know, pharmaceutical is such a broad subject and transfer pricing in particular in, in the pharmaceutical has its own aspect. So uh, we will try to touch some of the basics in transfer pricing uh, uh, issues in pharmaceutical. Of course, we won't be able to touch everything and to go much into details, um, but we'll probably do uh, more seminars in the future uh, and maybe even a mini academy series because pharmaceutical, at least for me, represents a lot of pharmaceutical clients uh, working on them also uh, as a member in TPA is a very fascinating uh, subject. So Maria uh, described uh, 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 and we are all see this chart of the research, development, manufacturing, regulatory and market access and marketing and sales. I would like to say a few words about R&D. As we all know, R&D in all companies is, is a certain risk. R&D expenses could be characterized as a risk because, you know, you're investing a lot of expenses in R&D. You never actually know 100% if you will succeed or not. So in the, in, theoretically, uh, you can work very hard invest a lot of money in R&D and in the end of the day uh, that uh, won't uh, yield anything, uh, no sales or disappointing sales. In pharmaceutical, that's even worse or better, depending on how you look at that, because pharmaceutical R&D can take years, many years, sometimes more than 15 years or even 20 years until you, until you get uh, what you want. And in Israel, by the way, we have many pharmaceutical company um, working right now also on a cure, not the vaccine. It's true that Israel got vaccine uh, to the COVID-19, most all of the population right now, but that's another thing. A lot of, a uh, couple of pharmaceutical companies in Israel working right now um, on a cure, on a medicine, not a vaccine to COVID-19. Hopefully that would be uh, a successful uh, project. And this is unusual because this is in, under a time pressure. Usually, the time pressure of a pharmaceutical company depends whether this pharmaceutical company is a generic pharmaceutical company or an innovative pharmaceutical company. And of course, we have also uh, uh, biosimilars and biologics and biotech and biomed and all of that. But just to facilitate, to make easy the, the, the discussion we're having right now, 
let's think about the generical pharmaceutical company and the innovative pharmaceutical company. So even for the generical, you know, sometimes when I'm, I'm speaking in panels and something like that, the first reaction of people who are, who are uh, interesting or working or dealing <clears throat> with the pharmaceutical companies is that uh, they're thinking that R&D is only with the innovative uh, uh, pharmaceutical company because again, what's the difference between the innovative and the generical company? The innovative company inve is inventing a product, is creating a product from zero, from scratch, to the final product. So obviously the R&D is probably the most important thing at the beginning because they are developing the product. They would like to assess a certain uh, problem with medical, with pharmaceutical, and they're trying to develop something. So, you know, huge R&D expenses for years until something comes up. And the generical pharmaceutical company is not inventing a product, it's imitating actually the innovative company's product. So for example, if there is a product of the innovative uh, uh, works for a certain disease, and then the generic uh, company waits for the patent uh, to expire, what we call the patent cliff, uh, in order to market at the exact same point, it's imitation for the product, um, much, of course, cheaper than the original product. So the R&D of the generic company is existing, it's alive, it's huge cost, and it also takes, you know, much of the time. So there is an R&D. The R&D of the generic pharmaceutical company is to develop, in other words, copy. That's, that's the R&D, to copy uh, the product that would be the exact same thing clinical which where the ethical is actually inventing the product. So R&D can take a lot of time, especially in pharmaceutical, and it has proven in many articles and many researches that um, statistically, the ratio between R&D and gross profit, but particularly R&D by sales, you know, the ratio of R&D expenses to revenue to sales is actually how much R&D expenses we're allocating from the sale. And it proved to be that the more it's higher, the higher it is, then the operating profit, which is the EBITDA, the operating margin of the company would be much better, would be much higher. Now, when we are treating R&D in pharmaceutical, it's, it's also in other companies, but especially in pharmaceutical, we've been challenging very much by the tax authorities um, because I've been through many uh, tax audits and many of them were in the pharmaceutical area. And, uh, and today, because of the VEPs and everything and DEMP and, uh, and all of that, and we're going to touch that, um, the tax authorities um, uh, are challenging, you know, tax authorities today challenging R&D service providers all over the world because they're trying to say, you know, with all the respect, sir or ma'am, this is more than a routine R&D that would be entitled to a routine cost plus as a routine service provider. In the end of the day, this R&D has a huge effect. That's why we want to apply another method, maybe not the cost plus, and we'll talk about that. But the uh, the definition of R&D in this context is not necessarily like a regular R&D. In fact, uh, the only R&D that goes smoothly today, and this is also is changing, is actually providing of clinical trials, R&D of clinical trials, things like that on the cost plus. All others R&D, even generics R&D, are being challenging all the time by tax authorities. So if I am an IP holder, if I develop something, but I use it, uh, one of my uh, subsidiary in other place of the world to do a research and development for me, uh, today I've been challenging all the time because the tax authorities, they're saying that this development, and again, think about like 15 years, 20 years, 10 years, not like two or three years, and I'm not talking about COVID-19, of course, that's, we're gonna touch that, that's something else. I'm talking about the ongoing concern of a normal world, a normal world can be. So the tax authorities in the jurisdiction of the R&D so-called service provider will try to say that, you know, you are a service provider, you characterize yourself, the group has been characterizing you as a service provider, when in fact, 
you are doing such a great and important job that in the end of the day, it's the R&D is that's more even important than the marketing and the patent registration and everything. So you're not just entitled to a cost plus, but maybe to something else. And this is very difficult to measure because as Maria uh, showed in the, in the chart that we see, we have clinical phase one and two and three and we have the basic research and the preclinical, and all of these can be measured on a different transfer uh, pricing. So to, just to conclude that, and of course we can talk about it uh, 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 even more, just to conclude that R&D and especially in pharmaceutical is a very challenging subject today and has to be examined very carefully. Um, that's it about that. We can move to the next slide. Thank you, Yaris. Yeah, and talking about uh, innovative uh, drugs versus generics, uh, you can also see, see uh, in this chart that uh, in OECD countries, generics have quite a stable share, which is slightly growing by the year, but it's quite a big market share. So uh, there is uh, indeed, yeah, it's it's a uh, yeah a stable market, uh, and uh, it should be taken into account uh, when you're doing transfer pricing. Uh, yeah, if they want to add anything else here on generic yes. versus technology. Yes. Pleasure. Thank you, Maria. Let's let's take this again. Let's let's continue with that because that's very important. Um, let's uh, take again this innovative versus uh, generics, and let's take it to transfer pricing. So let's describe a case that I've experienced, um, and we've handled that. So so basically, uh, basically, let's say. Uh, that uh, we have uh, an IP holder and we have its distributor uh, who is uh, selling uh, the drugs. So uh, very, very uh, generally speaking, without get into now method like uh, CPM, TNMM, things like that, which uh, you all, of course, all of, all of you know and familiar with, let's assume that the distributor uh, is, uh, again, distributes the products. And now comes the question, uh, not only what products that this distributor distributes, whether it's generic or innovative, but what kind of uh, characterization the marketing uh, we can say about the distributor. Whether the distributor is doing a generic market to a generic product, or maybe it's doing an innovative marketing to an innovative product, and maybe some mixture. And let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. If we are talking about a generic product that's already in the market as its innovative type, and it's the same product, only now much cheaper, for example, because that's what distinguishes sometimes the generic from innovative, of course, and that's the reason for, for working on generics. Uh, and then, so for example, the distributor would do a marketing. It will do sales and marketing in the functional analysis of the transfer pricing study. It will be characterized as a distributor, whether a full risk distributor or a low risk distributor, we all know that, and will be uh, entitled to a certain compensation, let's say of an operating margin. Um, but the marketing is doing is basic generic marketing because uh, you know the, the, the community, the customers, the institution are already familiar with the products, so all it takes is just to bring it, and, and again, I'm just exaggerating, of course, for the argument, it's far, far, far more complex than that, but it just takes to bring it to the market, and that's the challenge, to bring it to the market to the right time, to challenge the patent, to wait for paragraph four, patent cliff, and all that, and be ready on time to go to the market and enter. Where an innovative marketing, like when you're selling a new drug or something that I've never seen before, or an improvement of a drug, or maybe uh, a drug which we call a, a, like an orphan drug, if, which is something uh, that you're all familiar that is for a special disease, a very rare disease. The, it's not only the innovative product, it's, on, it's also the innovative marketing, meaning that you're not just bringing, you know, contacting pharmacies and doctors and bringing them the market and just that, again, I'm exaggerating, but you're actually what I call in transfer pricing in pharmaceutical, you're educating the market. This is very important. You are educating the market, meaning that you are sitting with people, you are talking with them a lot, you are doing conferences, 
uh, and, and you really make them learn about the product. You're investing so much money and so uh, much resources uh, and people in order to do an innovative distributor, an innovative marketing. And if that's the case, the question is whether uh, just to leave an operating margin, for example, as we all familiar with, is that sufficient? Is that enough for an innovative marketing where maybe it can work on generical marketing? And the answer, according to what we've experienced with tax authorities worldwide, is that they're expecting something else today in an innovative marketing. And this uh, brings back uh, another issue that we're going to touch in a couple of minutes, which calls segmentation. So um, about this segmentation, we, I think it's going to be uh, uh, in, in uh, two slides, something uh, like that. Um, but there is a distinguishment if, between an innovative marketing and generical marketing. And I will speak about it again when we come to the uh, uh, section of uh, segmentation. Another thing I want to mention is that uh, also in transfer pricing, when we are, the, uh, you know, we are doing the function asset and risk, and the transfer pricing method, and we are picking up uh, what method to use and which profit level indicator, we also have to take into consideration regulatory issues like FDA and also antitrust. Because again, if the distributor is facing a severe uh, antitrust issue or the IP holder has is investing a lot of money about uh, uh, you know approvals like FDA, that has to be entered also into the analysis and to pick up the right compensation. And we're gonna talk about it when I'm gonna talk about in a couple of minutes about the, the DEP. Um, so that's about uh, innovative, uh, for, for now, of course, innovative uh, and generics. And of course, we also see the chart, the percentage shares of generics uh, with values and uh, with volume versus, uh, versus uh, the other drugs. And that says it all. Uh, yeah, we can move to the next uh, one, Maria. Sure. Yeah, the next topic we would like to cover uh, is the active pharmaceutical ingredient. And again, a bit of definition for those that are not that much into pharma. So uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient uh, is the ingredient in the drug, which is uh, biologically active. In other words, that's the part of the drug that produces the intended effect. And some drugs uh, can have multiple ingredients, while others are based really on just uh, one active ingredient. And the production of these ingredients uh, has been uh, traditionally done by the pharmaceutical companies themselves. Uh, but nowadays, uh, some corporations opt to uh, even uh, yeah, third-party production of, of the API. Uh, and that changes the pharmaceutical value chain uh, significantly and of course has also effect on transfer price and how the tax authorities see the value add uh, by this active pharmaceutical uh, ingredient. Yaris? Yes, so uh, let's take this also, thank you Maria, let's take this also to transfer pricing of course and let's think about one large multinational. So basically, when we're thinking of la one large, uh, I'm talking about the huge, uh, just you know, just to illustrate the, the discussion here, let's talk about like a, la a large multinational, a pharmaceutical multinational, in the end of the day, selling drugs, selling maybe medical devices um, and, and everything. So, and let's assume uh, that this uh, entity, the large pharmaceutical multinational, uh, does it all, meaning um, it's not outsourced for everything. For anything, everything stays with the multinational. Of course, it, ha it has companies around the world, uh, like uh, all multinational, in particular uh, pharmaceutical. But it does it all. So it starts with the API, or the, you know, it's like they're doing procurement of uh, of what they need to create the API. There is R and D, by the way, about the API because also to you know to produce a certain raw material, the the, the active pharmaceutical ingredient, the API, uh, for uh, for, uh, for the drug products also uh, takes a, a certain uh, uh, R&D. And again, again, the API pair itself can be also an innovative API and generical API. That, that, that's, that never changed. That, that's the old assumptions still stays there. So basically that company is doing the API and after that, uh, when it produced its own raw materials, 
uh, its manufacturer with these raw materials, the product, and after it uh, is doing the product and the R&D and everything, so you know, uh, years passed by, and then we have the final product and it goes to the market. Very general speaking, very basic. Um, but sometimes, uh, and in many cases lately, we've seen companies that uh, multinationals that one company uh, in particular a certain jurisdiction i'm not taking i'm not talking now about tax incentives and tax jurisdictions i'm talking about just a different place so let's say one company uh within the multinational one company within so related parties one company within the multinational is doing the api and that's everything it does only the api and then it sells this api to another company the i would say the r d company the manufacturer company let's say the manufacturing company but again these two companies are related whether they're sisters their parent their daughter whatever they are related companies and they are both with the same group so think about it think transfer pricing in this context generally speaking we would say you know that we have uh, a company that is doing the drugs and the company within the group that it's selling the drugs. So we have the IP holder, the manufacturer, the R&D, everything, and we have the distributor. We're all familiar with that. But we can theoretically, and we've seen many cases like this, have a company within the group, like I said, who's doing only the API. So for the contest of transfer pricing, this particular company is the IP holder of the raw materials and until the raw materials are being sold or being transferred like via transfer price to the other company within the group then we have an ip holder which is the api and we have the buyer within the same group who is the manufacturer so the ip holder in this case only of the raw material you know it can sell the api like in license to get royalties or maybe some kind of a service or maybe just selling the products in, in a regular transfer price and then the manufacturer company who is buying the product acts as, as a distributor in a certain places because it's going to sell them it's going to be a resale but when it buys the product from the api company then the all thing starts back because then we have a new ip holder because you know so, so let's summarize that we can have theoretically one entity within the group who is doing only the raw materials so for the sakes of these raw materials only these raw materials this this is our ip holder then it sells this ip holder and the question would be what would be the appropriate transfer price what would be the arm's length price in this transaction to the next level to the manufacturing company and the manufacturing company uh, will will be the new IP holder once it's finished to produce the product and sell this to the other company, which is the distributor. So what's important to uh, to see here that we can't really isolate the API from the products unless we are talking about the same legal entity, the same legal entity when we can see it maybe as one production line and even there sometimes we are being challenged because it's different procedure but in other cases when we see a lot like i said when we have an independent api company and an independent manufacturing company that are related in the end of the day in one group the compensation would be have to be examined very very carefully um we can continue maria Yeah, um, another topic we wanted to cover is uh, why certain models work and others don't. And of course, uh, the big subject nowadays is offshoring versus reshoring. And in this slide, we just summarized uh, what are the pros and cons of both. So it's not like uh, for it applies for every company, but I think it's important to take into account. So for offshoring, of course, you have uh typically low manufacturing costs because you can uh, move some of the production to local location and can become cost competitive uh if you move out your ip company uh then uh, you can probably have some uh tax benefits 
uh, and of course you also can uh, choose uh, based on location some favorable resources such as highly skilled professionals uh, or any other uh, market benefits uh, that, that that can uh, help you for the business on the other hand of course offshoring uh, especially offshoring of IP creates difficulties uh, in uh, substance proof uh, and in that sense then leads to high risk for companies uh, in establishing economic and legal reality. And uh, as a consequence of that, uh, you would probably have higher tax, tax risk uh, and more audits. Uh, reshoring, on the other hand, uh, allows you uh, maybe to be in a close proximity to your customers. Uh, of course, if you have your manufacturing onshore, uh, you maybe can have better control of your uh, product quality uh, through the manufacturing practices and also through the more, the more strict regulations for your factory. Uh, and you would have flexibility and probably shorter uh, supply chain and logistics. And lastly, uh, structures that are uh, onshore typically have low levels of scrutiny by the tax authority. Uh, on the other hand, you probably would have high manufacturing costs uh, and uh, more strict environmental uh, standards, and of course, labor standards as well. Uh, and here, I give word to you. Yes, you wanted to talk about the segmentation of activity and uh, density, I guess. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, just to add about uh, what Maria said, so this is very, uh, very uh, uh, illustrative table that demonstrates uh, uh, the pros and cons in offshoring and reshoring, um, and this this is actually something that happens uh, in in recent years. Um, so if we were used to the areas, the times when it was you know 100% natural, uh, you know you could if, you can always bet on that. If somebody would ask you uh, that if you have a certain company in the states or in the UK, then you say all right, well so. We may, where is the major manufacturing taking place that you would say um, probably in India or in China and in other places uh, maybe uh, in tax uh, low tax jurisdiction and everything um, this has started to be changed in a lot of industries and especially in the medical device and pharmaceutical industry by the way when I'm if I'm mentioning the medical device industry, a lot of things I'm saying right now and Maria is saying right now and also the title of this webinar is pharmaceutical um, but uh, the majority of that uh, uh, I, in, in case of transfer pricing and offshoring reshoring and segmentation that I will speak in a minute is also uh, connected also to medical devices um, which is the medical industry and uh, these uh, sometimes uh, these industries are very much similar but of course uh, there's uh, still the unique difference like the raw material and the drugs and the uh, all all the other stuff that uh, really different them but there're certainly similarity um and and actually uh, a couple of articles and uh, talked about also uh, the last uh, administration of uh, Donald Trump who just uh, uh, re been replaced as we know by Joe Biden um, it, it, the last administration, but this has been proven uh, to take some time, also uh, released uh, uh, ex uh, you know, executive order to promoting the domestic of development and manufacturing within, you know, domestic within uh, 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 the United States and also uh, increase uh, the supervision um, and checking and monitoring what's going on overseas, um, um, asking and urging also the FDA to make uh, for the, this company life uh, sometimes more uh, difficult. Uh, of course, now uh, with the vaccine and uh, COVID-19, that's also uh, uh, got its special uh, place right now. So that's about uh, offshoring and reshoring. And yes, uh, many companies are considering and in actual they're doing today uh, reshoring to a lot of places, uh, to a lot of activities that were characterized as offshoring before. Let's go back to, as Maria mentioned, the segmentation. So uh, it used to be times uh, many years ago, um, but there are still companies who's doing that uh, today. I've noticed um, that uh, you have to decide um, what is your really, what are you really doing uh, in your pharmaceutical company? Um, are you selling uh, only generical companies? Are you selling maybe also innovative products? 
um, are you providing services or maybe licenses or are you just uh, selling? And even within generic innovation, there's also sometimes tenders. There is, like I mentioned, medical devices. There's over-the-counter product, OETC. And of course, there's also uh, purchasing from third parties, like raw materials from third parties and products, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And sometimes the nature, like I said, the, the, you know, the generic versus the innovative, the nature uh, of these are quite different. So um, if you convince or you convince yourself or try to convince the tax authorities, the transfer pricing uh, uh, unit, that uh, even though you have generic innovation, tender, uh, medical devices, OTC products and more, that in the end of the day, your distributors pretty much market all these the same way, then you can claim I have one basket. I have one basket, I want to treat them all as one basket. It's sometimes very difficult to do so today because again, there are differences between the resources, the funding, the market, their regulatory affairs, the regulation, uh, and the marketing again, whether you're just uh, selling the products on the generic type or really educating uh, 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 the market. Um, so, um, Sometimes when you're convinced that uh, these are actually even different activities, not just different uh, industries, different market and different product, then also the transfer pricing should be different. Let me give you uh, just a quick example. Um, let's say uh, that uh, a certain company has a generic uh, selling, uh, a generic uh, marketing and it uses a certain uh, uh, method which uh, uh, characterizes a certain distributor, whether at low risk or full risk, entitled to a certain operating margin. But let's say this distributor is also doing for a for certain other product, is also doing an innovative marketing. The question would be, what should be his compensation? Because obviously, if he's doing an innovative marketing, like I say, um, it's going to be very hard for me just to give him 3%, 4% operating margin. And especially today, with all uh, the BEPS uh, uh, time and everything. So I have to think, what can I give him? Maybe, maybe I can still keep the 4%, 5%, but also had, for example, a cost plus for the marketing. So let me repeat that because that's very important. Basically, if my distributor is selling my product, is selling my product, it's not me who is selling the product, it's my distributor, then my distributor, again, generally, you know, basic transfer pricing, it's not a title to a cost plus because it's not, of course, it's not a service provider, it's a distributor. So basically, it's entitled, if I'm choosing a certain method, uh, to get a certain percentage of the sales, like we all know. So we can leave him, for example, that certain percentage of sales, but maybe we can consider also paying him another cost plus not for being a service provider, but for his special marketing efforts. And that goes back into segmentation because I may ask my distributor, I will ask him, you know what, uh, uh, I know that you sold for 100 and you're entitled for 5% of this 100 to be remain with you and the residual goes back to me. But you also did a very great effort of marketing and innovative marketing and I want you to give me how much this innovative marketing costs you, direct and indirect cost, and I will add a certain markup on that, an arms and markup for your marketing efforts, and I will pay you that in addition to the operating margin. So this is an example of uh, working on segmentation and trying to find a couple of, uh, uh, you know, uh, many uh, scenarios or tipping methods that will suit the special uh, situation that uh, we're dealing. Um, we can move on, Maria. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, on this slide, you see just uh, yeah a very basic picture about the uh, dentist function, so how they lead to entitlement uh, for the profits. Uh, and I think here, if you wanted to elaborate on this point. 
Yes, so uh, everything I said right now was also, also true when the OECD started to work on the BEPS. You know, everybody knows the word BEPS. Uh, we are, we are you know, we're dreaming, we're thinking, we're leaving uh, BEPS for a couple of years now and it's not stopping, it's even increasing. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, be before the de be before the BEPS or during uh, the BEPS recommendation and all that, we were used only to work what we call uh, with the basic classical term functional analysis. In other words, let's assume we have two parties, and again, let's facilitate the the, uh, the discussion for um, uh, an IP older manufacturer and uh, and or, and versus his uh, uh, relative distributor. So uh, we were, you know, in a transfer pricing study, we have a chapter called functional analysis when we check the FAR, F-A-R, function ascendant risk. So for example, we were saying, uh, so the IP holder uh, is doing the R&D, um, is manufacturing the product, is doing the quality control, is packaging the product, is sending the products, also pay for that. That depends, of course, on INCO terms in the intercompany agreement, where the distributor, the related party distributor, receives the products, doing a certain marketing and sell them. So that so so the most of the, most of the function, if not almost all are uh, with the manufacturer and the IP holder. The assets, assets mean intangibles, uh, who holds the, the IP, uh, whether uh, they're marketing intangible, things like that. So let's assume, uh, classically speaking, that they are with the manufacturer and the IP holder. And the distributor uh, is only distributing the product. And now we come to the R, the risk. So who is bearing the risk? Or you're saying the manufacturer uh, is bearing most of the risks and uh, the group has for instance, a product liability insurance that was, uh, for example, uh, being paid by the manufacturer, so the distributor is not facing that risk. Uh, maybe the distributor is bearing a certain risk of, uh, of credit and marketing, and uh, but even though, even with that, the, ma the manufacturer will compensate most of its expenses, that would do, that would basically do. And in uh, the BEPS project, the OECD, uh, came up with a new thing called DEMP. Um, and before we talked about the DEMP, which I'm sure you already heard of, um, the essence for that DEMP was that the OECD, the BEPS project, and by the way, this was already approved and adopted by most of the countries today, of course, and they were thinking about the taxation of the transaction of the company in accordance to the economic reality again to the economic reality rather than the legal or contractual terms um, th this goes by the way to chapter 8 to 10 which calls aligned tp uh, outcomes with value creation it talks about intangible and this is basically speaks about economic ownership versus legal ownership because for many years uh, and also today um, uh, the ip holder was characterized first of all if uh, it uh, it was registered ID, by the IP holder. If the contractual terms, if the agreement says that he is the IP holder, um, and then uh, according to that, the IP holder would have to get the residual of the profit. But today, the DEMP, the DEMP is going for actually functions: the development, the enhancement, the maintenance, the protection, and finally the exploitation of the product. That goes for DEMP. The OCD says on the BEPS project, let's check this DEMP and let's continue the functional analysis with this DEMP and as, uh, you know, let's not only check who is doing what, who is bearing the risk, let's check also who is the actual controller of the company, who is the funder, who is the finance the procedure and who is really bearing the risk. And the BEPS project says, and again adopted by most of the countries, the BEPS project said, you know, um, if we, the tax authorities, for example, will come to the conclusion that one party is characterized by the company as the IP holder uh, under all contractual, and this is very legitimate because the contractual are real and everything is fine. But again, if the contractual will say that a certain party is the IP holder, but the DEMP and the functional analysis and the checking of economic ownership, meaning who is really doing most of the thing, who is bearing the risk, and who is giving the most of the contribution to the final product. 
so the tax authorities will say if we if we will find out if we think that the economic owner not the legal owner uh is the master here then then upside down to what we were used to we will we would like to allocate most of the profit to him so that's about uh, damp when economic reality is checking and if we are uh, taking that uh, to pharmaceutical and to transfer pricing so first of all about transfer pricing that's challenging a lot of method and for first the service provider so we have uh, sometimes a lot of cases when we have an IP holder who is the controller, also the funding, and we have an R&D service provider, and we gave you that example already, and then the tax authority will say the economic ownership, the economic reality, the real contribution of the product is not with the contractual IP holder, but with what you call the routine R&D service provider, and we are not accepting that all he's got to, uh, 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 to provide is is with uh, you know uh, with its cost plus an arm lens markup and that's why the uh, tax authority will do what they are doing for a couple of years now they will ask to look at a different transfer pricing method and that particular transfer pricing method would most of the time will be the profit split method the profit split method which is very popular today among the tax authorities will say I'm not checking who is the service provider and who is the IP holder. I'm checking reality of economics, of functions, of risks, of ownership, and of finance. And once I will check who's doing what and what is the real contribution of each party to the transaction, only then I can give you the right number, what would be the allocation of profit. So instead that the legal ownership uh, of the transaction will get 98% of the profit and 2% will go to uh, the service provider with the cost plus model, they will say the way we see it, it has to be divided, for example, 65% uh, to the IP holder and 35% to what you call the R&D uh, service provider. And in pharmaceutical, it's even more challenging. Why it's more challenging? Because in pharmaceutical, an IP holder it's not only it's not only about contractual terms wise being an IP holder. It's most of the time it's the one who really developed the patent, developed the molecule. This IP is a very very strong and huge patent, so we can't avoid that. I mean, even the tax authorities cannot say that just because the other side is doing a lot of stuff and facing certain risks then because of them is entitled to a lot of profit. In pharmaceutical, this has to be examined very, very carefully to see who developed the molecule, who is holding the patent, and whether this patent is innovative or generic. What is the forecast of that patent? Because let's say this patent will expire and then a lot of imitation, generic products will come into the market. Then the IP holder is not as strong because the patent is not as strong. Then all the emphasis, all the focus will go to the distributor. So DEMP with BEPS in particular in pharmaceutical is a very critical thing and old and uh, uh, models that used to be uh, working uh, before are not working anymore. Therefore, you have to examine uh, all the supply chain uh, and the damp in your organization in order to come up with the right transfer pricing method. We can move on, Marie. Thank you, Yaris. Uh, talking about the models that do not work, we have a question from our audience. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, one of our attendees is asking, uh, are you saying that it is impossible nowadays to have a limited risk distributor in innovative pharma segment, or is it still possible? How do you think? No, I, I would answer about that. It's, uh, I, it's true and very, very true that the classical low risk distributor is being challenged like a service provider with the tax authorities. They are trying to say, and uh, they get a lot of feedback from the best that they're really their low risk distributor model is not working anymore um, because of what I've said right now. But in practice, in practice, and this answers the question, um, as long as you're uh, doing all the analysis and explain uh, in the end of the day uh, who is doing what and really uh, damp analysis, 
it is proven it also in tax audits that the low risk distributor model is still working but requires more massive than the commentation than before. It doesn't mean that they won't try to challenge it again and then again and again. The tax authority today would always try to come to the profit split method, but it has proven for many years, and we've seen right now, and I've been in many tax audits and transfer pricing audits, that the low risk distributor model still valid only on new perspective and more, more the commentation and discussions. Thank you. Thank you for answering. So lastly, we have five minutes left, and I think that should be enough to cover for just some practical tips for the documentation for the past not so easy year. And of course, OECD issued uh, just recently guidance uh, on the uh, TP documentation and adjustments, as well as separate guidance. Uh, and if you have a credit, I totally recommend it to you on the uh, creation of permanent establishments where they uh, guide the location of people, which I think we now all struggle these days with all work from home. And tips from us is uh, do uh, the historical analysis, uh, focusing on any previous downturns and see uh, how those impacted uh, your financials and your value chain. Also take into account the specialties of your industry. If you are in pharma, that I think is a must. Uh, and your geographic and competitor analysis because different regions were affected uh, quite differently by COVID. Uh, also, of course, that's uh, applicable always, but do the long-term and short-term forecast uh, and see if uh, the impact of COVID can, uh, in certain ways, be mitigated going forward. Uh, and if you uh, had certain uh, IP movements last year, uh, or if you created a hard to value intangible, then we definitely recommend uh, to refresh your valuation analysis uh, to check the discount rates and other valuation assumptions uh, that you did. Yaris, over to you. Yes, I think uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, we are not living in a normal time right now. Uh, and plus, we actually, we don't know when it ends. Uh, and uh, we would like it to end very much as uh, soon as possible and goes back to normal life in all aspects and all, of course, business-wise. Um, and it's true that uh, some industries were affected less and some industries were affected more. So, uh, you know, uh, show business, hotels, transportation were affected very bad, uh, uh, but maybe food industry and maybe pharmaceutical, especially the one who gives in the vaccines, are very profitable right now. Um, we also, you know, we, we, we conducted a webinar uh, specifically on that, uh, which was very important. I'd just like to summarize a couple of issues uh, about uh, that. Because this is an abnormal time, also the transfer pricing uh, should be treated uh, like something unusual right now. So when we are doing our transfer pricing documentation for 2020, for example, uh, when we already were in that COVID-19 time and we're and it now goes also into 2021 and let's hope it finished as soon as possible. We have to treat that and also uh, we already uh, uh, received feedbacks from the tax authorities on, uh, and from many jurisdictions. We have to uh, check whether something changed uh, with the damp uh, with the roles, with the functions, with the risk on COVID-19. We have, if, if we have to document, we have, if, if we want to achieve something out of it, we have to document all the economic aspects to explain, for example, why this crisis has affected us, um, why we are, we can change maybe APAs with the tax authorities, advanced pricing agreement, because this is a new time, but maybe for only for a couple of years and then we change it again. Um, we have to think whether they are changing our business strategy. Maybe you receive some government assistance. This is a very important subject to see whether it goes within the transfer pricing or no, or not. Uh, when we're doing transfer pricing adjustment, if we're leaving a certain percentage, maybe this particular year of COVID-19, we are entitled, we can leave lower margin with our distributors because of COVID-19. Of course, if we're explaining that, um, and, and that goes, of course, also when we are doing transfer pricing benchmark, if that's the method we are picking. Um, so we are expecting if, well, as soon as we have data 
for this crisis year to see lower margin. But if we don't have that data, maybe because of the circumstances, we can apply margins from uh, you know previous years like 2008 and 9, uh, when we have a very severe economic uh, uh, crisis. Um, we have to look at our agreement. We have to look at finance. So a lot of pharmaceutical companies is doing cash pooling. Uh, captive insurance, uh, of course, uh, intercompany loans and capital notes. Maybe these would be also for reassessment because like a uh, certain uh, you know, business or citizens going to the bank these days and say, you know, I'm dif I have difficulties right now to pay a loan um, because of the COVID-19 and the bank agree with them. So that would be a certain indication for an arm length transaction. Maybe intercompany, we can change uh, that too. We can maybe use cost plus zero just to covering the cost in the end of the day, just to summarize that and, and, and that to conclude this webinar before I, uh, Maria will give the conclusion. Um, it's not a normal year. We have to assess what we're doing and if we would like to apply lower margin and maybe losses or maybe things like that, we have to explain and that should work. It's a very important subject. There's a lot of uh, publication with the OECD right now and tax authorities in many jurisdiction uh, follow that. That's an advice uh, that could be an advantage uh, in these uh, days if it works. Thank you. Um, with this, we conclude our webinar. Uh, and if you have any questions left, please feel free to contact us on our website, ptglobal.com, or through email. And we hope to see you in our next webinars. Thank you.